is a really uh, a desperate need for um, straightforward solutions that work for 75% of people, 75% of the time. So hydration is key. Maybe you could underscore just how, how key it is for us. And then what is the Galpin equation as, <laughs> as I call it? And I think others are now referring to it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, benefits of hydration slash consequences of, uh, mishydration. So whether that's dehydration or overload, you, you physiology has hormetic curves. Right now, typically we think about this in terms of toxicology. So what this means is at some point, giving you a dose of something up, uh, testosterone is a very easy example. If you're clinically deficient or low in testosterone and I give you a little bit and it brings you back into a normal range, you generally see an improvement in health and functionality. Taking you though from normal to super high doesn't always necessarily provide additional benefit. In fact, if you continue to go, it's gonna provide detriment, right? So everything has this curve. And then some things are hormetic stressors, which means like a, a small, short, fast insult is actually beneficial because then you come back bigger, faster, stronger. And it's, that's how mm -hmm. adaptation works. Mm -hmm. Basic hormesis, okay? Hydration is the same way. So at the end of the curve here, if you are underhydrated, we all know you could die, right? You have to have things. In fact, um, water is the only thing that is ubiquitous across biologies in terms of every living thing has to have it. There's no other vitamin, mineral, nutrient that is required among all living things with the exception of water. So that should give you a pretty good indication of it's importante, right? Like you got to have this thing. Down here at the bottom, if you're dehydrated and I give you more, it's beneficial effects. However, if you're up the top already and I continue to give you more water past that, now we run into actual problems and we can get what's called hyponatremia, which is more common than people realize. Um, natremia being actually not referring to the water, but the, the sodium concentration being too low. And you've probably talked about that at length of, of why that's an issue. Um, if sodium potassium balances inside, outside a cell come off, your heart stops, right? Muscle contraction ends uh, and all these things. Um, so you don't want to be over or under hydrated. So understanding the, this rough equation I sort of loosely calculated one day is helpful for that. Um, I think the, the most context is, is talking about how much water to drink throughout the day and then how much water to drink during exercise. So the, the very easy answer is half your body weight in ounces per day is a very loose guideline for total amount of fluid consumption. So if you weigh 200 pounds, aim for 100 ounces of water. It's like a very easy number. If you hit that, you're probably, I'd say 90% of you are good 90% of the time alone. If you then go to exercise, you need to then account for that fluid loss with exercise. And in general, you want to consume 125% to 150% of the amount of weight you lost in fluid. In other words, if you worked out and you were 200 pounds naked and you went and did your workout and then you dried off and you weighed yourself again and now you're 198 pounds, you lost two pounds of water. That's 32 ounces. You want to drink back about 125% of that. So instead of drinking 32 ounces, I want you to drink 40, 42, 45, like something like this. Because one of the reasons why is unless you're drinking something that is isotonic, meaning the same exact concentration in your blood that you're in your fluid, you're just going to go closer to that hyponatremia. Um, you're going to get a bunch of baroreflector reflector responses and you're going to actually think you have too much fluid and you're going to urinate it out. What so, if I'm not weighing myself before and after workouts? And um, is there a, a shorthand version of this that, uh, you know, after training for an hour, I should drink at least X number of ounces? Yeah, that does. Assuming it's at, at kind of taller, you know, I'm not sweating super heavily. Yeah. Um, in that particular case, you could probably go something like if everyone in the world did, I don't know, 12 to 20 ounces, that's probably like pretty decent. And they're probably doing that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And what now, about electrolytes, uh, consuming salt, potassium, and magnesium? But, but that thing only works though if you're coming in at optimal hydration. And this is the problem. This is why you have to you have to flag this starting with a good total daily amount of water. Because if, if you're coming in and you're like, oh, I drank two or three glasses of water a day, then you might need to drink 50 or 60 ounces post-workout because you're way behind. So that like, oh, 12 ounces or so works if you're already generally very well hydrated. And if people are drinking, you know, four to six glasses of water a day, but the, they're also drinking a lot of caffeine in any form, then they're going to be excreting more water in most cases, right? Uh, well, because, it, because caffeine's a diuretic. It, it, okay. It, it kind of is, but it kind of isn't either. It's not the diuretic that we used to think about it as. Um, it is still fluid consumption. So it's only a diuretic if it causes you to excrete more fluid than it actually 
was being intake. So um, if caffeine intake is in a normal range, I don't, I don't have to worry about the diuretic effects. If someone is drinking 12 cups of coffee a day, like we're, we're gonna, or they're taking caffeine pills or something, now the excretion is going to outkick the coverage. So now we're going to have problems, right? Because there's no fluid consumption with the caffeine pill. So in general, things like tea consumption, like I'm not super worried about those things. You can count those towards your to total fluid intake if you want. So if you're like, I drink 60 ounces of water plus 20 ounces of coffee, and then, you know, this, like you're going to add that all up and you're going to be totally okay. So natural, form you also have problems with synthetic forms of caffeine versus natural forms of caffeine. Natural forms are, are, are pretty okay. So coffee, be just fine. tea, et cetera. Yeah, all that stuff. Pill form is where it gets tricky. Always, like every, always, right? So general, just eat real food and things. You're gonna be just fine. Um, the last piece to consider is your diet quality matters because um, the fluid content in your food can vary wildly. So something like a bagel um, might be, you know, five to 10% water or something like a watermelon is 98%, 95%, something in a huge range. Even meat is very high percentage of fluid intake. Like it's a really high, even after you cook it, there's still a lot of fluid in there. So if you're eating a whole food, mostly whole food based diet, your endogenous hydration is actually pretty high already just from your fluid. If you're eating a very highly processed, dehydrated, oversalted diet, you've, you're way low on hydration just in your food. So you have to factor all these things in. In fact, one of the things that happens to us constantly with folks that go from a like highly processed, low quality diet to a high quality one is they just, they're just peeing nonstop. I'm like, what the hell is going on? I'm like, well, you actually have brought in 60 additional ounces of water in your diet relative to what you used to have. And you've gone from 10 grams of sodium there to four to two, sometimes one. Sometimes it gets very low because you're not like salt. Are you salting your food? No. Okay, well, we don't have sodium intake then. Like we're way down. So everything that we're considering is based on that. So let's assume someone's eating a, a pretty well balanced diet. They're drinking 60 ounces of water and maybe some caffeine and coffee and tea, things like that. Um, we don't exactly know the optimal amount of sodium one should intake. It is very clear high sodium concentrations are still associated with a lot of negative health outcomes, especially in combination with poor physical activity, in combination with low food quality and other comorbidities. That's a very bad thing. You need to be very careful about those things. Um, if everything else is okay, uh, we're okay playing with a little bit of higher salt. In fact, you're, you're probably gonna feel better. You're gonna feel generally pretty good. Um, you just, it needs to be very clear. If you are overweight, highly stressed, and you don't have a lot of these things ticked off and you have known comorbidities, you really need to pay attention to salt intake. It can be very nasty. Um, so that being said, what we're generally going to look at folks is, are you at least, can we categorize you as a low sodium or high sodium sweater? If so, there's a whole list of electrolytes you can look on that are going to have something like 200 to 400 milligrams per serving. And there's a whole list of these things. Um, if you're a low sodium sweater, you're, I'm probably going to send you after one of those. If you're a high sodium sweater, there's a lot of electrolyte supplements that are closer to six or 800, even a, even a whole gram. Um, per single serving size. So you want to play with that. Um, a very How do you know if you're a low sodium or high sodium sweater? We actually have an episode on salt that we put out that, um, or is coming out soon if it hasn't come out already, which is, uh, you know, when you look at the hazard ratios yeah. for salt intake, um, yeah. basically your probability of really bad things happen to you goes way up as you get towards, you know, a lot of sodium intake, you know, 10, 12 grams totally. per day. And um, it, and this is translated to teaspoons of salt, et cetera, but also very low yep. sodium intake is a problem. No so question it's, about it's it. A, it's not a perfect U shape. It's kind of a J shaped uh, curve or a kind of hockey stick sh shape more or less. But um, how would I know if I'm a low sodium or high sodium sweat? Yeah. So you can would get I just kind of lick my sweat or have well, someone you, else do you it? You can. Yeah. Find a super friend who will lick your sweat for you. That's same with how- no, no willing volunteers that I'm aware of, but would I be able to tell? Yeah. Um, you can get sweat testing done. Actually, you have a, a number of, options. Um, the kind of the original one that most of us use in the background for many years was called Lebelin. Um, They'll send you out a little patch. You can wear that, send it in the mm -hmm. lab, and they'll, they'll measure it directly in the lab and send it back. It's 150 bucks or- Do like they bin you like into that. low, medium, and high sodium? They're going to do that, but they're going to give you very, they're going to tell you exactly the milligrams. And then they're going to actually tell you like what products and stuff and 
um, that that are exactly matched. Do you do this with uh, with professional athletes? We have many grade? times. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you can do a more consumer grade version. Gatorade has a patch for twenty five bucks. You can get two of them. You can put that ca- patch on your left forearm and download the Gatorade app, and you can do a workout, measure it right there, and click it over, and they'll tell you exactly not only higher low, but again, they'll tell you the milligrams of sodium that are in your sweat, and then you can figure out again kind of high, medium, or, or low. Interesting. They I are, do much better on a uh, slightly higher sodium intake. Most do. Um, but And my carbohydrate, I do eat carbohydrates. I'm one of those that is pretty moderate, but I try and eat clean food. So I uh, I noticed, and I tend to be slightly low blood pressure. So again, mm-hmm. to reiterate the, the warning there, that if somebody is uh, prehypertension or has hypertension or obese, you really do need to be careful with your sodium intake. But many people seem to find that they feel better when they increase their sodium intake, and they're still in that healthy portion of the hazard yeah. ratio curve. M- most of the athletes... I would say in general, we're going to go higher in salt. When they come, we're going to run their stuff and we're going to add salt. Almost, almost always. Very few times have I gone, ah, we need to cut this back. Mm. With the exception of the ones that come in that eat like 14-year-olds. And I'm like, okay, you're at 15 milligrams or you're 15 grams a day because you're eating nothing but... Garbage. So we're yeah. like, we're going to come down. You're going to feel way better. and All this bloating and everything else that's going to happen, go down. Um, you can do that. There are actually more, there are biosensors that are coming out. Um, that are not available yet, but they're coming very soon in this space. They're going to be able to give you real-time metrics on um, salt. So you can pay attention to those. Uh, I haven't seen one and used one personally, so I don't want to um, espouse about how good or bad it is, but I know that those are coming uh, from a handful of companies. An easy way to do is just look at um, wear a hat or wear some sort of headband or something and do your workout. Take it off. If you see a just huge white band or if it's completely clear, then that's going to tell you. Big white band, you're probably a high salt sweater. Completely clear, very little coming out. That's great. And I, I can see the the posts on Instagram now, people showing their their salt band of from 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 sweating. Yeah. I mean, obviously salt is, is so essential for so many physiological functions. You don't yeah. want too high or too low. But if you're losing more, it makes sense you would need to take in more. Yep. So half of my body weight in ounces as a just foundation yep. of, of a fluid intake. Coffee and tea could be included in that, but that should probably be mostly water or things similar to it. Um, what and then during exercise, the how do I want to think about this again? If, let's yeah. say I'm a let's say I'm a high salt output, then I'd want to drink maybe forty ounces of water with or or more. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll do this easier. Um, let's talk about pre and mid and post. Right. So what to drink pre? If you st- if you come in having hit these rules, you're you're okay. And pre workout can be as little as like five or six ounces, basically a couple sips of water. Fine. Um, If you come in poorly hydrated, then you maybe need to go more like 12. But here's the deal. If you start off a session in a bad spot, you're not going to catch back up. Like you're you're just, you're you're in trouble. Let's say you come in, you you follow direction. 500 milligrams salt before, 500 milligrams after. A very easy rule Pick whatever source you want. That's a couple of sprinkles of table salt. If you want Himalayan, that's fine. You don't have to. Himalayan is actually a fairly low sodium salt. So it's not the best for, for this purposes. Um, if you're higher salt or sweater, a little bit more. If you want to go choose an electrolyte, of which there are infinite, um, you can look on the packet and it'll tell you, you know, 250 milligrams per serving or 400 or 600 or whatever it happens to be. But around 500 pre, 500 post is a very general rule. And then during is thanks to you, uh, my famous galpin equation now that is is all over the world all i did is i took the literature and i said okay in general the research shows pretty clearly two milligrams per kilogram body weight over 15 minutes seems to put you in a pretty good spot most people don't think about kilograms or milliliters so can i just run that over and it turns out it's about your body weight divided by 30 in ounces like that's that's all you have to body weight in pounds divided by 30 yeah exactly right so you weigh 200 pounds divided by 30 and that's the number of ounces you're gonna want to go every 15 or 20 minutes. Or so something. I'm getting that amount every 15 to yep. 20 minutes throughout the training. Yep. And now in the weight room, that's pretty easy to do because yep. there are rest intervals, but you, people will need to do this while running or yep. cycling. Um, and that can cause a little bit of gastric distress yep. if you're not used to it. Is that right? You can you can learn to run with, a, with some water in your belly. 100%. The, the gut is very trainable in a lot of directions, but in terms of fluid as well as carbohydrate, which is another thing that is going to get people um, but that's, yeah, very trainable. It'll be uncomfortable initially, but you'll, you'll quickly get into it. The better solution for those folks, just come in hydrated and you might not even need any water. You could probably perform 
just fine. Um, so the ones that don't have as much of an opportunity, you really have to emphasize walking in. Um, we have this problem with like uh, professional golfers. They have plenty of time to drink water, but they're so focused on the shot and there's a lot of variables coming up. Once they hit their shot and they're moving on to the next one, they're thinking about, I mean, they're going over a scorecard of 185 yards away. Can I go 184 and a half yards? Can I go 186 yards? What's the slope of that? Where do I, what's the wind up here? What's the wind up there? What's it, like, there's just, they're just a thinking and they just forget, even though they have four and a half hours. So we have to make sure that they immediately get off the course. We go right into recovery as hard as we possibly can. They wake up the next morning, they're in a good spot. We crush recovery. And now it's like, hey, if you can remember to drink this, great. If not, we're still fine. If it's not a big deal and you have time, like in a, a, a lifter, because I deal with that problem with fighters too. Like I, I, we can only drink so much in the middle of a fight. A couple of sips over here, but we, we can't go mix and two milliliters. It's like, can you get a couple of sips in? Yeah, oh shit, forgot. Like, it's not gonna happen. So we have to take more emphasis before and after. So start your recovery process immediately and then come in the next day. That's your window. And then whatever you can get in during the workout, that's fine too. If you're a higher salt sweater, instead of doing 500, 500, maybe go 750, 750. If you have a longer bout of exercise, especially if it's hot um, or humid, then you might wanna consider some salt in the workout as well. And 300 milligrams during the workout, totally fine. Um, it's enough. If it is a really long workout and it's really hot and you're going to lose pounds during it, you need a specific strategy. If you're going to lose less than a pound, you don't need to worry about it. You're going to be, it's not going to be enough of a detriment for you to really care. Um, so that's a kind of a, a rough rule. Now, if you're 200 plus pounds, maybe that number moves from one pound to two pounds. But really the number we're looking at is what 1% of your body weight. If you're losing more than 1% of your body weight, we need to start caring. If it's less than 1%, it's not going to really pay that much of a difference. Okay. So for myself, um, because I don't get super technical, I don't wear any devices besides a wristwatch. Um, it's a what nice I, watch. Too. Uh, thanks. I, I, yeah, do, they're very attached to this watch or it's Ooh. attached to me, I suppose. Um, my body weight in pounds divided by two, that's what I'm going to try and get across the entire day um, as a kind of baseline. And then my body weight oh, yeah. in pounds divided by 30 yeah. During the workout, yeah. every 15 or 20 minutes, that I'm going to try and consume that amount. And then I definitely do better when I increase the amount of salt that I'm taking in anywhere yeah. from 500 to um, a, 500 milligrams to a gram of salt um, several times a day, actually. But 